Hey, Jan, what are you doing? I'm reading my book. Well, why are you doing that right now? Because I'm on holidays. No, holidays are over. It's time to get back to work at the church. What? Yeah. Come on, let's go. We got to greet everybody this morning. Fine, okay, I'm coming. Good morning, everybody. We're back. We are so glad to be back at Emmanuel, to be part of our worshiping community here in North York. And wherever you're watching today, we welcome you to this service of worship and pray that God will bless you and strengthen you through our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we gather for worship today, let us hear from God's word. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things, to him be glory forever. Let us lift our hearts and our minds to heaven as we exalt our Savior and Lord today with insincere worship.
Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, I can feel this God song rising up in me. Good morning, boys and girls. Mr. Ben here. Um, hope you've all had a good week. Uh, it has been a crazy week in our world again, and I don't know how much of the events of this week you've paid attention to, or how much your parents or caregivers have talked to you, um, but my message to you is thank you for being you, and I miss you. And I say that because one of the things I really enjoyed about seeing you guys at church was seeing kids who are such a beautiful bouquet of differences, uh, learning together and playing together and getting along, and you are a reminder to us grown-ups of what God's vision is for His creation. Um, we were all made to love each other, and God's given us the power to do that, and for some reason, as we get older, it seems to get a little bit harder. Um, so I want to thank you guys, and I hope uh, that as the days and weeks go on, you're going to get a chance uh, to play together and to continue to love one another. And hopefully, sooner than later, we'll all get a chance to see each other once again and uh, the beauty that is all of you guys. So that's all I really want to say about uh, about this week and my, my heart's desire for you. Again, we miss you guys. You guys are amazing. And, uh, and I'm going to pray for you right now, okay? So, dear God, we thank you for each and every one of these boys and girls out there. We thank you for their willingness to love um, their blindness to the differences, and uh, we ask that you would continue to inspire us with them, with the children in our lives, and that you would provide opportunities for them to play with one another and help us to learn from them. Um, you use children as an example of how you want us to relate to you and to relate to each other. So bless them this week as the world continues to change around us. May we be reminded that you never do. And pray these things in your name. Amen. Have a great week, boys and girls. We love you. And now for our scripture reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all his people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people. 
and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that can be evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who in everything, in every way. In 1968, Stanley Kubrick's epic film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, was released to widespread acclaim, including a well-deserved Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. It was a groundbreaking film in many ways, and it has defined the genre of science fiction. Uh, hard to believe that it was 50 years ago that it was made. And who will ever forget the theme song? Da, da, da. Ta da! Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you can recall that, uh, that theme song yourself. I can't play it because of copyright reasons, so I have to do it, uh, just sing it for you. But it just was such an incredibly important science fiction film. One of the most interesting and unique aspects about this film is that it was a collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. These two towering figures in their respective fields work together, Kubrick writing the screenplay and Clark writing the novel. And uh, the film and the novel were both released at the same time. So I'd like to talk about the end of this film. Uh, it might be a little bit of a spoiler, but if you haven't seen it by now, <laughs> I don't think it's likely to be a problem of being a spoiler. So if I could just uh, summarize the film very briefly, it starts out with excavations on the moon where they discover this strange monolith. It seems to be something of a beacon pointing to Jupiter, so they uh, send the spaceship Discovery to investigate. They have all kinds of problems on the journey, including a rogue computer named HAL 9000. And in the end, the only survivor is Commander Dave Bowman, who decides to leave the spaceship and explore this mysterious portal in space. What happens next is inexplicable and confusing, leaving most people scratching their heads trying to figure out what's going on. After traveling through this psychedelic tunnel of flashing colors, Dave wakes up, on what a, what, wakes up in what appears to be an ordinary hotel room, except that the floor is glowing. Everything else is normal. And Dave sees himself He's watching himself aging, and eventually he's a very old man on his deathbed, and the monolith appears in his room. And then the film cuts to the final scene as a giant human fetus approaches the earth from space. Kubrick, the master filmmaker, doesn't try to explain the imagery. It is visually abstract, and the Internet Movie Database has several attempts of people who try to explain what it's all about. But this is where the, uh, the book by Arthur C. Clarke is somewhat helpful. This final scene is called The Star Child, and it's meant to represent the ascent of humanity from earth-bound human being to the birth of a, like a godlike being. The baby is representative of man's first tentative step returning to earth as a small g god. Overall, the movie really isn't about space at all, it's about human evolution and ascendancy and the star child represents the next leap in evolution. Now if you're a fan of science fiction you'll recognize the familiar theme. The human race is evolving and in time we will one day become godlike, liberated from our frail human bodies and infinitely powerful. It's a bit like the enlightenment on steroids. But there's something deeply paradoxical about this fiction. Someone like Arthur C. Clarke, who, who really didn't think much about people who believed in faith, who had faith in God, yet he wrote fiction 
which imagined that our human potential, perhaps even our human destiny, was that someday we would evolve to become like God. Does that not strike you as ironic? To adamantly deny the existence of God on the one hand, and then to believe that human beings will one day become godlike. I guess I shouldn't be surprised because after all, this is the oldest temptation in the book, casting ourselves in the role of God. After all, that's what the serpent said to Eve. If you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. When it comes right down to it, whether explicitly stated or implicitly imagined, every one of us wants to be like God. For the secular humanist, the dream of becoming godlike is a dream of self-actualization, of evolutionary ascendancy. It's a kind of self-glorification. But for the believer, the dream is not that we will become God, but rather that we might become more like God. It's never to assume the role of God in our lives, but it is an invitation to be, for God to be the center and the focus of our lives so that we might grow and mature in order to reflect his truth, his goodness, and his beauty. The secular humanist dreams of a greater self. The believer dreams of a transcendent self and it is an ascendancy of sorts, but not for our own personal gratification, but rather for the ultimate glorification of God. Now, speaking about towering figures in their fields, in the 20th century, there was a theologian by the name of Paul Tillich. You've probably not heard his name unless you've studied theology, because his theology is very complex and hard to understand. It's philosophical and, and very deep. But here's one important thing that he said. He would describe God only with this term, the ground of being. You see, for Tillich, God is the source of being itself. Everything that exists, that has, been, that has life and being, has its ultimate source in God, the ground of being. Tillich would even say that describing God as the supreme being is inadequate and misleading because it starts with the idea of a created being, then supercharges it all the way up to the idea of being the supreme being. But the ground of being is outside and separate from being the way we understand it. It's not that God is the greatest or supreme being among all of the other beings, but rather God is where all beings have their origin and their source. God alone is uncreated. God alone is eternal, responsible for the creation of all beings through all ages of history. So Tillich's phrase, the ground of being, is powerful for it reminds us that any vision of God that comes through a gradual ascendancy is inadequate. It reminds us that God is wholly other. Now that's a philosophical and theological reflection on the nature of God. The practical reality of the ground of being is far more important and so much more fulfilling in the life of the believer. Remember the old hymn, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's what comes to my mind when I think about God as the ground of being. It's like we're adrift on a sea in the midst of a storm and there's nothing to grab hold of because everything around us is chaos and turmoil and then we see the harbor behind the breakwater where we can moor our ship to the dock which holds us fast and secure. Where everything else is changing and shifting and unstable, we have found the ground of being upon which we can stand. God who is eternal, immovable, solid and secure. This is why we need a relationship with God. In this life, we need an immovable reference point outside of ourselves 
where we can plant our feet and be connected to the source of strength and life outside of ourselves. And this is what the Apostle Paul longed to, to see in the lives of all believers, an experience of the living God that was so dynamic that it was transformational. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, he writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and the incomparably great power for us who believe. The Apostle Paul prayed this prayer for the Ephesians, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would allow them to know God better. And if you're paying attention, you'd notice that Trinity is represented in that passage. So when it comes to knowing God, you would think that Christians would have a good handle on that. But sadly, in many cases, people, don't, people know about God without really knowing God. If I were to ask uh, what you could tell me about God, I'm sure you would say many things like he is omnipotent, he's transcendent, he's holy, he's omniscient, he is the God of the Trinity. <laughs> yes, the Trinity. Let's just think about that for a moment. Orthodox Christianity has long settled on the do doctrine of the Trinity as a way of understanding and describing God. One God in three persons. Theologians and artists have tried to express the doctrine of the Trinity through the ages, and it's difficult. Not three gods, one God, one single God, revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you've ever had a Jehovah's Witness at your doorstep, and you've tried to talk to them about the Trinity, you'll know how frustrating it, it can be to try to explain this doctrine. So, I've got an idea. Why don't we consider the Trinity from a different perspective? Let's stop thinking about it as a doctrine and instead start thinking about it as a revelation of God which invites us to have a personal encounter with Him. Well, actually, this isn't my idea. I borrowed it from Christian Schwartz who has written about spiritual growth and maturity in his uh, as part of the natural church development materials. So let's start with God the Father. From the very dawn of time, people have believed in God, the God of creation, the God of the cosmos and the universe, the God of majesty and wonder. Who hasn't laid down in the grass on a warm summer's evening, looking up at the vast expanse of space and found themselves overwhelmed with the grandeur and wonder of it all? King David, who as a young shepherd must have spent many nights out under the stars, wrote these words from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. This same creator called Abraham and made a covenant with him and with his descendants. He spoke to Moses and through the burning bush, the I am. Years later, when Jesus came, he called people to return to God. He didn't point to himself. He pointed to God, whom he called Father. But Jesus himself was more than just a prophet, more than just a man. He performed miracles, cast out demons. He interpreted and refined our understanding of the scriptures. And more significantly, he did things that God alone could do. For example, he forgave sin. Was he a prophet or just a man or was he something more? Eventually, the early Christians came to see that Jesus was the Son of God. Not in a generic sense, for we are all sons and daughters of God through creation, but in a very special sense, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. So when Thomas was with the disciples after the resurrection and he saw Jesus standing among them, Thomas fell to his knees and said, my Lord 
and my God. A personal encounter with the risen Christ radically transformed Thomas's vision of who Jesus was. And then there's God the Holy Spirit. Similarly, when the disciples gathered on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that they heard a sound uh, like a violent wind which filled the house and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim that the Spirit is God's force or power. They claim that the Spirit is an it, not a who. But when Jesus was preparing the disciples just prior to his death, he said to them in John chapter 15, verse 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The Greek word that's translated uh, comforter or advocate is parakletos. And you can note that in this case, it's a personal pronoun, he. Not in the sense of gender, but in the sense that the spirit is a person, not an it. The experience of the disciples and the first century Christians were dynamic and profound. Their experiences moved them to reflect on the person of God the Father, the person of Jesus, the Son of God, and the person of the Holy Spirit. And it is within the broader confines of monotheism, the great Yahweh, the Almighty God, creator and sustainer of life, that there seemed only one answer to this great mystery of the Trinity. God is one, one God revealed in three persons. But don't miss this point. The doctrine of the Trinity is a theological expression that pulls together the actual experiences of believers as they recorded them in the Bible. It started as a self-disclosure of God, his personal revelation. Then later it was codified into a doctrinal statement. And so while the word Trinity doesn't occur in the Bible, and there's no explicit expression of the concept in the New Testament, if you look closely, you'll see it over and over again. As I pointed out earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, Paul said, I keep asking that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better, and that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and the incomparable, incomparably great power for us who believe. In verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Spirit are all there, active in the life of the believer. But as important as it is that passages like this show us the early church's awareness of the three persons of the Trinity, much more important is the Apostle Paul's encouragement for all believers to have an experience of the revelation of God so that you may know him better. Doctrine is important, but personal relationship is so much more important. The danger of the doctrine of the Trinity is that it ends up being a concept, an idea, a theological thought, and an abstraction. Not that we shouldn't reflect theologically on what we believe, but those beliefs have their basis in experience, in the self-disclosure and the revelation of the living God. I know that Emmanuel Baptist Church has had some experience with natural, ch uh, natural church development over the years, NCD. Uh, so I'm not 100% certain to what degree these materials have been used in the past, but I would encourage anyone who wants to go deeper as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ to utilize the tools available through NCD. One of the books that has been written by Christian Schwartz is called The Three Colors of Spirituality. And it gives additional tools and analysis to help each of us to grow deeper in our knowledge and experience of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Schwartz writes about the Trinity using the analogy of three colors. God the Father is green, like the green of nature and creation. God the Son is represented by the color red, like the heart and hands of God in us. And God the Holy Spirit is represented by the color blue, like wind and sky. Another way to say this is the Father is the world, the Son is the Word, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit. And these three distinct colors, green, red, and blue, when combined, create white light. And God is light. And so this book, The Three Colors of Spirituality, is a very helpful book because it doesn't just help you learn more about God, but it helps to guide you into meaningful ways of experiencing God more personally and relationally. And it's beneficial because it begins with the premise that everyone is wired differently. And so we respond to God very differently. Another book that's helpful that some of you may have experienced is called Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. Very similar. So here's the model proposed by Christian Schwartz, the three colors. I think it would be great if we could arrange to do a workshop sometime this year, if it's possible, since I found this teaching extremely beneficial. But if the workshop's not possible, then you can pick up a copy of the book, fill in the brief questionnaire at the beginning, and help to guide you uh, with a little bit of an overview of, of uh, what your color of spirituality might be. So at the top we have green. Green is the world, it is God the Father. These people feel close to God through sensory and relational activity. Sensory might include standing in your bare feet in the grass or enjoying the beauty of nature through hiking or watching a brilliant sunset. Relational might be somebody who enjoys reading or some other intellectually stimulating theological writings, like Paul Tillich. Before I go on, undoubtedly some of you are thinking to yourselves, well, that's not the way I would want to grow closer to God in faith, and that's okay. In fact, that's precisely the point. Each one of us is wired differently. And if we figure out how we are wired, uh, it will help us to gain a better appreciation of how we can grow more deeply in our faith. And also, equally important, it will help us to appreciate how very different other people are wired so that we don't judge others because they're different than we are. Okay, so let's move to the right side. Red is for the word. People in this segment feel closest to God through scripture. This means they love to spend time reading God's word and reflecting on it. Others in this quadrant might um, feel close to God when they share their faith, when they're telling others about their faith in Christ or sharing the gospel. Finally, this blue segment represents the Holy Spirit. And people in this area may feel closest to God through mystical or enthusiastic experiences of faith. The mystic spends time meditating and imaginatively seeking God through guided exercises of prayer and meditation. Whereas the person who is enthusiastic may be most comfortable when they're shouting hallelujah or praise God in a worship service or in their times of prayer. There are also three additional styles that are on the borders between these others, sacramental, doctrinal, and ascetic. Now, <laughs> don't worry, there will not be a test. I don't expect you to remember all of this, but I wanted to bring it today as a way of introduction to help you to start reflecting. As I was going through all of these styles of spiritual expression, which one immediately felt most natural for you? And just as importantly, did you notice which ones made you feel uncomfortable or uneasy? That's also important, as it can help you to be more appreciative and understanding of others who experience meaningful encounters with God in different ways than you do. Now, it may not surprise you to learn that I discovered that my native style is the rational approach to faith, a logical and almost a scientific approach to God. I guess no one should be surprised because I started this morning's sermon with 2001, A Space Odyssey, and then I quoted Paul Tillich. That's a bit of a giveaway. 
I found the material in Christian Schwartz's book helpful because it confirmed what I already knew about myself, that I'm more likely to feel close to God when, like King David, I sit under the canopy of stars and consider the remarkable wonder of this world that God has made. The heavens declare the glory of God. Not only the glory of God in nature, but I'm also moved to feel the presence of God when I'm when I marvel at remarkable human in engineering as well. For example, I went to a Blue Jays game back in the Sky Dome in the early 1990s. Normally they make the decision about opening or closing the roof of the Sky Dome before the game begins. On this particular day, it was sunny and the roof was open, but about halfway through the game, an unexpected rain shower appeared and they decided to close the roof while the game was in progress. <laughs> it's the only time I've actually been in the building watching the roof moving and oh, it was awesome. No one was watching the game. We were all transfixed by the spectacle that was taking place over our heads. These kinds of experiences, of course, they don't replace the need for scripture reading, for prayer, for worship, for fellowship with God's people, but they are the kinds of experiences which, which catalyze and experience and inspire me to draw closer to God. So I want to encourage you to also pursue your spiritual style as well. Your native spiritual style may be the complete opposite of mine, mystical or sacramental. That's okay. In fact, it's good because one thing that I've learned that I, that I can learn from you, that you can learn from me, is that we have different styles and we need to learn from each other. That's why we're all together in the church so that the diversity of the body of Christ can work together and complement each other as we give expression to our faith in this rich tapestry of different styles. When we learn from people uh, in each of the different areas, wor world, word, and spirit, we're actually able to see a more complete vision of God. Each of our views and experiences are partial and incomplete, but together we have a more holistic vision of God, the ground of being, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who has called us out of darkness and into his glorious light. Let us pursue God together in our spiritual growth and in our discipleship. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we thank you that not only is this a rich doctrine, but it is also a rich revelation that helps us to understand and appreciate who you are that you are the ground of being, that you are the God who has revealed yourself uh, through the Father and the Spirit and the, uh, and the Son. And, and in all these ways, we can grow and develop in our faith. Help us to continue uh, to pursue our faith through these experiences that we might have, whether it is through the world or through the Word or through the Spirit, they're all valid and important. And we pray, Lord, especially that you'll help us to understand what our, what our native spiritual style is so that we can focus in that area and grow and develop in our faith as we draw closer to you and closer to one another in the church. We thank you for your word, and we pray that you will lead us forward each day. In Jesus' name, amen. stories of what 
I am so grateful for the ongoing faithfulness of the people of Emmanuel in supporting the work of ministry through these unprecedented times. Whether you drop off your offering in the church mail slot, donate online via the website, or whether you've signed up for pre-authorized giving, you are making a difference as we raise up the light of Christ in Don Valley North and Willowdale. As we consider the privilege and the opportunity that God has given to us to give, perhaps you feel the way that King David felt when he said to God in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14, he said, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Indeed, who are we? We are servants of God, called from darkness into light. All that we have comes from the Lord and belongs to the Lord. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the ground of being. Yesterday and today and forever, you are the same, changeless. You are the great I am. And so we come humbly into your presence to worship and to express our love and adoration to you as we return these gifts to you. We are only giving back to you what is already yours, but we give these gifts with our love and thanksgiving for your faithfulness. For this we pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Hear us, O Lord, as we pray, separated in our various places, but together in spirit. We bring you praise and worship, for you alone are worthy of all praise. We lift our eyes in adoration for who you are as our great God, creator of this magnificent universe, and yet personal enough that you call us into a deep, intimate relationship with yourself. We offer up to you our gratitude for the very breath of life that sustains us, for the abundance of your blessing, for the joy that fills our hearts as we contemplate your mercy and grace showered upon us. We cannot comprehend your love that knows no limits, but help us, Lord, to embrace that love, a love that surrounds, sustains, and strengthens us, a love that calls us to total trust and abandonment, a love that calls us deeper. Our only response is one of praise and thanksgiving and an offering of ourselves in loving service. Give us the courage, Lord, to turn away from the things that lure us away from your love, things that have superficial attraction but no eternal value, and instead to yearn for that deeper relationship with you, to know you better, to love you more, so that our service flows out of your love, your strength, your mercy, bringing us real joy. We want to turn our blessings into blessing for others, and so we pray for others. We know that there are those within our congregation who are finding it hard to be joyful today because of their life circumstances. Some are sick. Some are grieving the loss of loved ones. Some are in need of work or a better work environment. Some are discouraged by life in general. Some are fearful for the future. Lord, you know every situation. Nothing is hid from your eyes, and you are the healer. So, Father, as a congregation of your followers, we come before you today asking for our brothers and sisters that you would pour out your mercy in abundance, meeting every need according to your good pleasure. May they be surrounded by generous hearts, who seek to bring them comfort and provide for their deepest needs. And even as we ask that, we realize that we may need to be the answer to our prayer. So as we draw close to your compassionate heart, move us to compassion. And Lord, right now, as we share in the compassion of your heart for the people of Lebanon, whose world has been shattered beyond belief, our hearts cry out to you to intervene and to bring healing and hope and new life. We pray for them and for the many other places in the world where strife and disasters, both natural and unnatural, create vulnerable people. We pray for those in places of power who respond, that they would be honest and just in their distribution of the generous aid that flows in. We ask that you would intervene and send people who will do what is right in your eyes. Father, we pray for the world around us that is so easily caught up in greed, greed that exploits the vulnerable, racism that gets played out in both overt and subtle ways, hatred that leads to violence, and the mistaken belief that violence can be eradicated by greater violence. Open our eyes to the truth in your command that we love our enemies, for love is the only way to true victory. 
We pray too for the leaders of our country and all the countries of the world, that their decisions would be guided by your wisdom. Make them mindful of the great responsibility they carry and the importance of their integrity and moral uprightness in carrying out these duties. We ask that you would ra raise up godly leaders and that we, as your people, would support and encourage and be faithful in our praying for them. Humble us, Lord, through this time of separation, isolation, so that we may truly seek to know you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at a deeper level, and that we may surrender anew to the work of your Spirit in our lives. May the fruit of your Spirit grow strong in us. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and draw us deeper into the truth of who you are. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Morning, Emmanuel. These are the opportunities for this Sunday. Camp on the Block has been over uh, for past two weeks, and um, we are excited to show you another episode of Survival Girl. So enjoy this survival tip video on how to survive Sunday school online. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Survival Tips. I'm your host, Survivor Girl. This week we're going to be learning about how to survive in something some of you have experienced and some of you have not experienced. But it's very fun, it's very exciting. We're going to talk about how to survive Sunday school online. Now, some of you may be asking, what is Sunday school online? I'm glad you asked. So, Emmanuel Baptist, which we're part of, uh, has Sunday school online on Sundays at 3 p.m. You can talk to Espresso if you want to know some more about it, but for those of you who do, he has some fun tips on how to survive and get the most out of Sunday school. Now, one tip you can use to help you survive and thrive in Sunday school is the important, the crucial skill of time management. 
That's right. Come on time to Sunday school. You know why? We always start with a game and the games can be pretty fun. And if you come on time versus you come late, your chances of winning increase by 100% because you're actually there and you can maybe win. Sounds like a good time to me. Okay. Never have I ever done a TikTok video. Put a finger down if you have, guys. Come on. Tatiana, Olivia, you guys got to put it down. <laughs> yeah, never have I ever had a beard. Put a finger down if you have a beard. What's going on? Hey, you missed our game, Survival Girl. Oh, if only I had come on time. I would have played it. Welcome to youth group guys um, and Sunday school. Um, we are so excited that you guys are here. We're gonna be playing a game. Never have I ever. Do you guys know the rules? Yeah? On time. Yay! Yay! <laughs> now, another important skill you need to survive out there in the wild is knowledge. You need to know what you're facing and what you're doing. So, like in Sunday school, another thing you need is knowledge. That's right. Have your Bible handy dandy right there. This will help in case something crashes or you want to read along or you want to make any notes. Having your Bible out can be really helpful. You can even have your Bible out on your laptop, but it just really helps with following along, being able to read ahead, make notes, do what you want. Knowledge is power. Oh no, my Zoom call crashed. I'm going to try logging in again. Where were we before? Wait, I have the Bible. That's right. I remember what passage we were on. Excellent. Awesome. Okay, so I know we're going to be talking about this. So even if I don't go back, I can still follow along. Now, another tip that can help is if you're in youth group and you're starving, sometimes I am, let me tell you, you can always grab a nice little snack to have and munch on while you're listening and having a good time with everyone. But the most important thing is to put yourself on mute. Mute yourself, because then nobody wants to hear that while we're listening to Zoom. Think about others, put yourself on mute if you're gonna have a snack. So Esther saves uh, her people uh, because God places her in the right place at the right time. What is that? Stop. <laughs> Oh, thanks for putting yourself on mute. Yeah, so Esther saves her people from Haman. Now, the most important tip, are you listening? Listen close. The most important tip is to have a good attitude. Sunday school is a lot more fun when you participate and join the conversation. Just like in order to survive in real life, we need people in Sunday school in order to survive and thrive. We need to come together. We all join for the same purpose. We're trying to learn from the ultimate teacher of survivor skills, God. <laughs> He's the one who teaches us how to survive in life. So connecting with our friends, coming to learn, coming to talk, coming to have fun. That's what makes Sunday school the best. That's what makes us thrive. So that's the story of Queen Esther and how she saved her people. Now. Wow. That was an amazing story. I really admired how Esther uh, stood up for her people, even though she didn't know what was going to happen. I found it really encouraging and I'm really, um, it was a really moving story. I really appreciated it. Thanks. That's cool. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. Do you guys have any questions about what we talked about today? Hmm. Well, I was thinking, why did God choose Esther? That's a great question. Yeah, God chose Esther because um, she was, yeah, I mean, she was one of his people and uh, he placed her in the right position for the right time. And God can use any of us, no matter where we're from and how big or how old we are um, or what we do, God can use us wherever we go in life. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I know, I know, I'm just as sad as you are. So. I've been your host, Survival Girl, on another episode of Survival Tips. 
I'll see you next week. Remember, stay safe, drink water, have fun. Morning, Emmanuel. This is our benediction for today. May you find God's peace um, throughout your weekend and throughout your week. We are so happy that you joined us this Sunday and may you find the peaceful place uh, to restore and re be refreshed and connect with God just like this lake here. Oh.